We're going to talk this morning about Irish censuses and census substitutes. So um, we'll get started. I'm going to start sharing my screen and um, Valerie will tell me if I go off air, which I hope I don't. Valerie is co-hosting our Chronicles editor. You probably know her from the, the webinars on castles and the Bloomsday webinar, the fantastic castles webinar that, that happened or occurred last week, um, which was really good. Um, but anyway, we'll get started now. And then what we'll do is we can, I will answer questions at the end. So please type in questions into the little chat box um, because you're all muted. I'm not muted. And then I will stop when I stop, I finish off. I'll, um, I'll answer the, the questions as best as I can. Now, you will be getting a, um, an email after in the next couple of days, uh, maybe Saturday or early next week about the summary of this webinar. Um, you can, if you have any questions after the webinar, there is no problem with emailing me. So please feel free to do that. I'm happy to answer questions. I may not answer them right away or, you know, within the next day, but I will get to them within the next few days. So there is absolutely no problem with asking me questions. So, um, and Valerie has just put up the pop any questions and we will put them up. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and we will get started now. Okay. And there we are. Now, Irish censuses and census substitutes. Um, and there's actually quite a bit of information in Irish censuses. Um, all is not lost, even though we only have technically two full censuses to deal with at this time. Now, we have the 1901 and 1911 census. And they, they're very valuable because they offer us a snapshot of every household in Ireland at a particular date. In 1901, it's the 31st of March, the evening of the 31st of March. And in 1911, it's the evening of the 2nd of April. And they give us a, a very interesting and um, in some ways, a very comprehensive picture of what life was like in the household, economically, socially, um, and other information about the house, not just um, who was there and what age they were. So they, now the 1911 census um, asks two additional questions, which can be very, very helpful. The 1901 census does not ask those questions, but it gives information about the family members, occupations, ages, counties of birth, the literacy, whether a people were able to read and write, and that can be a very interesting thing to look at, and people's marital status. 1911 adds two new questions, the number of years married for a couple and the number of children born and those children that are living. So that can be, that's further information that can be very, very helpful to us. So I'll keep moving along here. Form A in the both censuses, there's three forms there, B, A, B1 and B2. Form A is the household form. That's the form that lists the head of the household, usually a parent, uh, in some cases a grandparent, uh, the number of people and their status, uh, what they do, are they farmers, are they laborers, are they um, servants, um, are they visitors? Visitors is considered an occupation and that's very useful. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Um, their ages, what county they were born in, their occupations. Most children in school are listed as scholars, um, whether they could read or write, the language that they spoke, uh, many people were still um, using Irish and English. Uh, their religious affiliation or religious denomination, whether they were Church of Ireland or Roman Catholic, and their marital status. So there's, there's quite a bit of information really in that. The Form A also gives you the location of the property, the, the town land where people lived and the, um, it gives you a house number. Now, the house number is not really relevant um, because the house number isn't like an address that we have. It's just a listing in order where the enumerators went from one end of the townland to the other. Uh, a house number in the 1901 census is not the same as the 1911, unfortunately. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too excited about house numbers. Um, one thing though you do need to know it's very helpful to know, I should say, is your district electoral division um, or your DED. 
And this is an administrative division that was created and used um, as part of the Local Governments Act, which came into play at the end of um, the end of the 19th century. It's now known as the Electoral Division. If you're somewhat familiar with the two census forms, in urban areas, you'll note that there's wards. There's Ward 1, Ward 2, Ward 3. Um, wards and electoral wards are the urban areas um, that they're the, the denomination or the administrative unit for the urban areas and electoral divisions are for the more rural or the town areas. Um, now you can find, you can find families without knowing an electoral division or the district electoral division, but it can be tricky if you're not sure of townlands, um, if the family has a very common name or the, the parents that your person that you're looking for is a very common name. Um, so it can be a little bit trickier. Now I've given you a, um, a link there and that's the Irish Genealogical Research Society. If some of you are familiar with it, it's a very good organization that has a lot of very helpful information. Um, for free, you don't have to join. And one of the things they have is you can input a townland and just to try and determine what electoral division your, um, you know, it, uh, it, it is in. And the purpose now that can be very useful because electoral divisions come into play with um, voting lists as well as with um, other administrative. Uh, uh, items or documents that you may find you will be using um, later on or doing with if you do other research so I would um, I would recommend that you take that down you can screenshot that if you want we, we can give that to you in the chat later on as well but um, it's good to know the electoral uh, that district electoral division and it does come in handy as I said for voting lists and for land and land is something that I'll be covering in another webinar but that having that DED is um, is a good, you know, it's good to have. So we'll continue to move on. Now, this is an example of Form A. And um, I'm going to talk about this in a little more detail. This is the form for William Pohl. Uh, an American would pronounce him as Powell, but over here they call him Pohl. William Pohl, the William Pohl family who lives just down the road here in Clondorney or lived down the road here in Clondorney. And William Pohl, we can, we can look at it here and go through it. William Pohl is a 60 year old Church of Ireland uh, farmer. And he's married, he's living here in, um, in Clondorney and he was born in County Clare. His wife, Mary, is alive. She's 55. Um, she's listed as a farmer's wife, um, born in County Limerick. And they have six children, and they also have a servant. So um, they, their six children are listed, Belle, Marcella, Thomas, Mary, Fanny, and George, their ages, um, their occupations. The, the older girls are listed as farmer's daughters. Um, and Thomas is listed as a farmer's son, and then the scholars. Uh, now, George is, uh, George, sorry, uh, excuse me, George is his brother. George is living in the, the house as well, and George is not married. So jo George is an unmarried brother that's living with this family, and they have a servant, Annie Mack, who's the only Catholic listed in the household. Um, they're all literate. Um, all of them, bar Mary Powell or Powell, are living in, uh, are born in County Limerick. And um, so they, that's the information, the general information you get from the, um, from the Form A. Now, Michael Mullooly, you see a, a name there at the bottom, was the man who would have written up this form. And often these forms were, um, these, these censuses were undertaken or enumerated by members of the, um, the RIC or the local constabulary. So, you know, the reason for that is that they'd be fairly familiar with the area um, and with the families. Now, the only thing is that a lot of them, uh, well, not a lot of them, but some of them would not have been familiar with the Irish um, the Irish spellings uh, so that you can find that uh, names can be misspelled, even an area, townland can be misspelled if you're trying to search for it. So just be aware of that. 
that they, um, the spellings can be a bit funny. So Michael Mullooly uh, enumerated this census and William Pohl um, signed it because he, he was literate and he was able to um, uh, write, read and write. So we'll move along to the next, um, the next census or the next form. And this is form B.1, which is the house and the building return. Now, I think these forms are really interesting. Um, and I'm going to go through them there in, um, in a little bit of detail. William Pohl's house number was one. So his house is described in a certain manner. And it, the, the, the B1 form gives you, it classes the houses and it gives you some information about there or some description about the house. So the walls of this house are, are the number of people living in this house, first of all, in William Pohl's house, which is a private dwelling, is nine. So there were nine people living in the house. That's a lot of people. Um, that's, and the house is obviously inhabited because you have nine people living there. Now, the walls of the house were built with um, one, the number one. And the number one indicates that they were built with either brink, brick, concrete, or stone. So that's a fairly well-built house. That's a solid house, right? Um, the roof of the house was slated, tiled, or iron because it has the numeral one attached to that column as well. So it was not thatched. It was not a thatched house. So that indicates if a, if a house is, um, in 1901, if a house is tiled or slated, it's a fairly, um, it's a, a fairly secure house, okay? Um, the uh, rooms of the house, the number four does not mean there were four rooms. If, and it's very small writing. The number four is the number given to a house that had between seven to nine rooms in it, which is a lot of rooms at that time to have in a house, okay? And it had windows in the front. It had six windows in the front. So that indicates that that was a fairly big house uh, that was not a little thatched cottage um, by any means. So they then add those numbers up, and the number 12 is given in the, the total column. And the 12, anything 12 or over, is a first-class house in 1901 in Ireland. So that's the nicest type of house that you can have. And William Pohl, um, obviously, is, is living comfortably at that time. He and his family are living comfortably. And when we go over into the, um, the right side of the columns, there's only one family living in this house and that's William Pohl and his family. And um, there are 10 rooms total in the house and nine people live in them. And William Pohl is the landholder of the house, of the building. So that indicates that William Pohl is fairly, fairly comfortable. Now, Underneath William Pohl, there's John O'Halloran, who is the other family in the townland. And I, didn't, um, I don't put on Form A for him. You can look at that in your own time. Now, John O'Halloran, um, also living in the house in a private dwelling, but his dwelling is not as um, comfortable, let's say, as, um, as William Pohl's is. And when we go across that, or across the numbers, the particulars of the inhabited house. Again, the house is either um, slated or, uh, or you know, it has a thatch a, or a, a slated roof or a tiled roof. It's built of concrete or stone. So it's, it's a reasonably um, secure building. There are, um, the number two there indicates that there's between two and four rooms as opposed to seven to nine rooms. Um, there's two windows in the front. And uh, the number, the total comes up to six, which is half the total really of William's house. So it's a much smaller house, but it's a second class house, which would be a very comfortable house as well. Um, and there are um, three people living in that. So John O'Haller and his wife, and I think there's a son or daughter living with them. Um, so that's a different, but it, there, you can see the difference in the two, the two types of housing. And of course that indicates that William Pohl is probably more comfortable um, 
than John O'Halloran, uh, certainly with the house that he is residing in. Now, there's another form, the B.2 form, which is the Outhoff Offices and Farmsteadings. And that is another very interesting form to look at. And it's just, instead of just going in, I, the point I'm trying to make with the census is, is just instead of looking at the, um, the list of people that live in a house, it's also good to look at what else do we know about them? What's the house like? And do they have outbuildings and farm steadings? Do they have a farm? So here's form B.2 for the um for Clondorney and for um, William Pole and John O'Halloran and we see on form B.2 that William Pole has nine outbuildings attached to the um the house so that's pretty substantial William has a stable a coach house two cow houses a calf house a piggery a fowl house, a boiler house, and a barn. So he has a lot of buildings attached, and that indicates that he's very actively farming, and he's farming um, more, um, you know, he'd be farming at a, a bigger level, let's say, than John O'Halloran, certainly with two cow houses. That's not something I see too common or too um, frequently, two cow houses. You might see one cow house, but two cow houses would indicate that he's very actively farming and he, he has a reasonably big farm. And we don't have any information about the land here, but the buildings are telling us the story. Um, and I, I think it probably wouldn't be a surprise if we went and we looked at the acreage there through Griffith's valuation, which we're not going to do today. We'll do another time. Um, not there would be no surprise to see that it's it's a it's a large farm. Now uh, John O'Halloran um, has a, a piggery, and that's the only building, the only outbuilding that John O'Halloran has. So John O'Halloran has his house, and he has a small piggery. Um, which I, is, um, is interesting now. Most people I would have found very, or uh, laborers or, or uh, small, very small farmers would have had a fowl house um, and some of them would have had a piggery. Uh, I think thought the fowl house would be more common, but so he only has one outbuilding whereas William Pohl has nine outbuildings. So that, that's giving us a lot more information about um, about the um, about the, the certainly the two families, but particularly William Pole. So I'm going to move along here. I'm looking at the time in the 1911 census. There's two additional questions in the 1911 census that we get asked, or they get asked, and they have to answer: How long were a couple married, and how many children were born to this couple? Um, now they make the comment: How many were born alive? and then how many are still living. So um, those questions, uh, for the most part, they get answered. So that's very useful information, as you well know, because if we know um, the number of years a couple have been, been married, but we haven't been able to find a marriage record, it narrows down those years for us, um, which can be very helpful. And the number of children born and still living, um, that also can indicate, uh, well, it'll indicate a death record as well as a birth record, a civil birth record. So that, that can be very, very helpful um, information as well. Now, um, I'm going to give you this form. This is a difference. This is, we're out of the rural area. We're in an urban area now, and we're looking at the form A, the household form for James and Fanny Hogan. James and Fanny Hogan, are a couple in their um, oh they're in their early 40s who are living in Glasnevin. Now James and Fanny and their three sons are living there. They're all Catholics. They're all literate, um, but they are. He's a shoemaker, and they have a son that's a boot looks like a boot clicker. Um, what? is of interest is that they when we go to the particulars as to the marriage which is over here on the right hand side they're married 22 years they have 12 children born but only three living okay so that is very significant because there are nine children that have passed away in this household okay this is not uncommon in urban areas um, when I was looking at some of this to, to use as examples, 
you will find in many of the urban areas there was very high rates of infant mortality so um, very sad certainly and but we know that from the history of the tenements in Dublin which were very very um, dire very really um, grim at that time um, and we also see that they came up from Wexford so they were they were all born in County Wexford um, so they obviously came into Dublin and it may have been the job that that brought them in there but um, but that that you can use that information you have now 22 years married so you have a, um, a date of marriage I think of around 1889 and then you, you have the three sons who are uh, still living their ages so you can um, work off that but you would look between 1889 and let's say 1911 and you would be concentrating on County Wexford as to other children born so that can be really helpful that that kind of information for the um the 1911 census form and everything else is the same um, the form b1 is the same and b2 they I, I didn't check this but i doubt very much they had out off out offices and farm settings there in a in an urban setting um, so but that's that's what's really helpful with the um with the um uh, the 1911 census now Getting on to the um, difficulty with finding um, finding family members, um, there are search options available for both the 1901 and the 1911 census. So you don't you don't only have to search for a name. You can search by occupation. You can search by location. You can search by a county of birth. You can search by marital status, by age, by particular illnesses. You can search, for example, for all of those who are deaf, okay? You can input that term actually comes up um, under the specified illnesses. Um, you can search for only those that are listed as the heads of family or as sisters or brothers or mothers or fathers. Um, you can search by language if you want only the Irish speakers and you can search by literacy if somebody was able to read and write are not able to eat, read, and write. Now, this is really, really helpful. And um, it's really helpful because you can have somebody that you just can't find. Uh, everybody else is there in the family, but one person is missing. In my own case, my great-grandmother's second cousin, who was six years old, I couldn't find her in this census. And I thought, where could she be at six years of age? She hadn't emigrated. She wouldn't have been working or living away from home. She was too young. Well, she was listed as a visitor in another household. Now the other house, now the other household was in another townland, which was next to the town, essentially the house next door, but just another townland. So the occupation can be very, very useful to list, look for visitors because you can find the missing person through one of those search options okay so i would i would recommend if you can't find somebody um to look using those other search options and and visitors in particular can be a hidden group for research because people were visiting and if they were visiting they were enumerated that evening in the household um, they weren't enumerated in the household that they lived in necessarily but the household that they were actually in so that can be really useful the other thing that can be useful is that the ric for those of you who have um ric research the the policeman or the the guardian research RIC can be researched as an occupation now it's um, because RIC men moved around so much and they were in various they were not in the county of birth they, they always had to move out um, that some in some cases in some of the census forms the names full names are given but in other senses more often than not the only you only get the initials but you can work off the initials using occupation and age and even county of birth you can add all those terms in and narrow down your search that way so that can be a really useful um useful way of looking at um at finding people that may be difficult to find okay now i did something there and th just to show you how how interesting this is i put in in the search options box 
those people that were born in Australia in County Clare in the 1911 census. And 46 people were enumerated that were born in Australia. And they were from all parts of County Clare. Now, what this shows you is that people returned, okay? People were out there and they came back. They may not have stayed after, but they were there on that night, on the 2nd of April. And it also shows you that, um, you know, the spread, the spread of people, they weren't just in one area. Now, I don't have them all listed there, but uh, there's 46 names there from Liston, Varna, Kilkee, Kilrush, Scarif, Crushing, Ennis, O'Brien's Bridge, Killaloo, um, North Clare, and Carafin. So there were 46 people enumerated that had been born in Australia, but either were back visiting or living in County Clare. So that's where that can really be useful. And it's not just Australia that you can input, you can input Germany, you can put input England, you can input the United States, which is also very, there were a number of births or a number of people that would have come back or would have been enumerated in the census that weren't, um, that were born in the US. Um, so that's very, very interesting to me anyway. And it's another, it's another, way of looking at finding a missing person. If you are looking for a family out in Australia and you can't find one family member, possible they could be back in Ireland. Very possible. Okay. Now, are there earlier censuses? Yes, there are. Um, there are, but they are census fragments, okay? The 1821 to 51 census fragments exist, and they are also on the National Archives website. So the drop-down list of the years, you'll see 21, 31, 41, 51, and then 1901 and 1911 come up. And there's a number of census fragments. Um, I wouldn't discount them. They're worth looking at. Now, for County Clare, it's not great. But for other counties, particularly some of the northern counties, it can be pretty good and, and certainly worth looking at. Um, there are 275,000 um, names, almost, almost 276,000 names, uh, search results in 1821 alone. So, um, they're not in County Clare, but they are in other counties. So I would definitely wor uh, look through those census fragments because you could find information um, about an earlier ancestor. It's quite possible. Um, you know, people, some people do get lucky. People do, really do get lucky. So I will, um, 18, just to say to you quickly, 1861 to 1891, they don't exist. Those censuses all got pulped by the British government in World War I. They needed paper and they pulped all those censuses. So those censuses are lost. However, if you have access to a library that happens to have the parliamentary papers, the EPI website, that Parliament, because the censuses were British, um, that they were done through the British government, every census had a, um, a documents created from a House of Parliament papers that went through the results or summarized that particular census. So while you won't get individual search forms out of it, you will get information by townland and by electoral division. And that can be very interesting to look at. Ages, um, occupations, um, number of families. So that you, you can see some information generally between 1861 and 1891, but you don't get names that, that just, they don't exist any longer. Um, so I will keep moving on here. I want to go through the 1841 and the 1851 census. The 1831 census, there's only, now there's a lot of entries in that. That looks like a lot of entries, 80,000 entries between Antrim and Londonderry. Big problem with the 1831 census. And they've said that, um, they, they discovered that very quickly after it. It was very, very um, poorly undertaken. Um, and what happened was census enumerators were paid by the number of people they enumerated. So they totally added on people that may or may not have existed. And it's very, very inaccurate for that reason. Um, so it's not a census that is really um, used often, but it can be helpful. There are, there are two counties there. The 1841 and 1851 censuses, um, there are not a lot of entries, but these censuses come into play for us 
with the pension application forms. And as a result of that, they are they're available, not the forms themselves, but the information that was extracted from them for pension applications. And there was the, the Old Age Pension Act came into play in 1908 in Ireland, and it provided a, a pensioner wage for anybody that could prove they were 70 years um, on that date or older. So a number of people made applications. Now, if you were born before 1864, there was no civil record of your birth. So you look through parish registers if you had them, if they were available, if they weren't available, if they didn't exist. It was the census form that that information had to be, um, had to be obtained from. So censuses, those censuses were checked. And the information that was contained in those censuses was put into people's, you know, at their application forms, and they had, they then were able to get a pension application. So when the four courts burnt there in 1922, not all the 41 to 51 or and 51 census um, records were there. Some of them were out, I assume, in Dublin Castle under these um, looking, uh, you know, under pension um, applications. So that's what has saved them. They are also on, they're also on the this uh, National Archives website under 1841, 1851 census search forms. If you have access to find my past, they have done a fantastic job of digitizing those pension forms. So if you can get access either through a library or you just happen to have access yourself with um, Find My Past, you will actually get the census form listing all the, um, all the household members in either 1841 or 1851. I got information about my great-great-grandmother from an 1851 census search form. She wasn't alive to make the pension application, but her youngest brother was. Um, so that can be really, really helpful. Um, and those are well worth looking at. Um, I'm going to keep moving along here. Yes, I, I show you there. And there's the census search forms, the, um, the, um, the what do I want to say, the link for that, okay. And that they did need to show that they were over 70. Now, census substitutes. And when I first was putting this together, I immediately was going to talk about Griffith's valuation. Now, I can't do that because Griffith's valuation will take too long. That's a separate webinar. But I can tell you that Griffith's valuation, officially known as the primary valuation of Ireland, is really one of our most important census substitutes for the 19th century. And the land revision books, um, and that'll be part of the next webinar, are very, very important for tracking or tracing people. And I'll leave it at that, okay? Um, tie the plotment books are another, um, another very important uh, census substitute, but they date back to 1823 to 1837, and they don't cover... Um, they don't cover every household. Um, the, they wouldn't be as good as the primary valuation. Electoral registers. There are voting registers um, that are online. I think Dublin City has voting registers, if I'm not mistaken. I know the city library does, if anybody's getting there. Um, the, there are Clare electoral registers online through Find My Past, and they're very helpful because they, they also track, now they only tra track the men and those that had, um, that had land that they were able to vote, but they can be very useful. They run from about 1885 to I think the early 1900s, some, somewhere in the 1900s, and they're very, very useful. And they, every three years, they list all the voters. So you can be looking for people, um, you know, to trace people along. School registers are another, um, another resource that are very good for census substitutes. Now, PRONI has, PRONI is the um, public records in Northern Ireland up in Belfast. They have those, a number of school registers for, or most of them, I think, for, for the six counties. I don't think they're digitized. I'm not aware that they are at the moment. I know that other school registers around the um, country have been, uh, have been digitized. Uh, the Clare Library has a number 
of digit or um, transcribed school registers. Uh, there's a long list of them there in the Clare Library. Locally here in Tulla, we have transcribed the registers. We're finishing up our transcription and we, we will have all those registers, not complete years by any means, but um, uh, done. So that can be very useful. Um, the flax growers list of 1796 is well worth looking at. Uh, for those of you who might be familiar with Falcha Rowich, um, very good website. That's totally free to look at. Um, 1796, you might say, oh, I don't know, you know, but a lot of people, the flax growers list listed all those people that got the spinning wheel and that were growing flax. And flax was a big industry, um, particularly in parts of the west of Ireland. Um, certainly in the north of Ireland, but as well in the west of Ireland. Uh, so it can be worth looking at. Um, you, you may find you may find a name there in the townland that you are um, you know your family is from. Uh, the More Peth Roll is another um, resource. Now I have not gotten any valuable information personally off of it, but I know other people that have. Lord More Peth was the chief secretary. Um, I think he was the chief secretary. Of, was he a lord lieutenant? And when he when he retired, there was a role created, a parchment created that everybody had signed, um, or a number of people had signed for him. Now, Morpeth role was very famous at one stage because Ronald Reagan's, um, a, a, pr a former president of the U.S., his ancestors were listed on that Morpeth role. So you, you never know who you can find. Um, uh, now, Gwenda, you're raising your hand, um, but I'm doing chat. I'm not doing the, the hand raising. Um, trade directories. If you have an ancestor that was a laborer or a tradesman in a town or village, a trade directory can be very, very useful. Trade directories are available. Some of them are available on Falcher Road for free. The Clare Library has some of them. I believe Limerick um, City Archives have some of them online. And you can, if you Google them, Trade Directories Ireland, they'll come up. Find My Past, again, has a number of them online, but like that, I, I think you have to have a subscription. Um, you can try it, try and see if you can look at them without a subscription, but I think you may have to have a subscription for them. But that's very good. Those were particularly useful as the 1846 Slater's Directory, which um, that was taken um, of towns and villages all over Ireland. And anybody that had an ancestor who was a tradesman blacksmith, um, tinsmith, um, grocer, um, you know, whatever they, um, they may, they should be listed in that. And then church censuses. Now I'm not going to really talk about those too much. Most of them are, um, most of them are 1700s to 1800s and they're Church of Ireland or in some cases I think they're Presbyterian. I think there were some Presbyterian or some Quaker censuses. Now if you have ancestors that are part of that religious um, group they may be very useful. Um, Prony would be a good place to look for them as well that for because most of them would be Northern Ireland and um, Prony, Prony has very very good um, very good records there. Um, now, I'm done. Um, if there are any questions, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So I don't know how many chat questions there are. I hope there's not a huge amount. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. And uh, OK, thanks. Very comprehensive talk. OK, great. Do you want to? Um, is it possible to have a copy of the presentation, Paul Stevenson? Hi, Paul. I think I know. Yes, I know you, Paul, from you're very involved there in um, Rahan. No, it's not Rahan. It's, um, oh, I forgot the name of it. We were up there anyway. Laura and I were up there in County Offaly, North Offaly there. Um, we're going to be sending an email. I was saying there, we're going to be sending an email out in the next couple of days um, with the, the resources that I've covered, most of them. Some of them I haven't covered. I added a few bits on, but I will update that after the 3rd of August. So um, not that I'm going on holiday, but just that I, I'm not able to, um, I, I need the back end to be able to work the back end and I can't do that on my own. So, um, but that will be updated. Um, you're very welcome from Dunedin. Sorry, Valerie, talk away. Yeah. Questions for you here, Jane, that I've just like- Great, yes. Yeah. I'm asking them. Uh, so somebody asked if you can explain what is an EPI website? Oh, EPI, E-P-P-I, Enhanced Parliamentary Papers Index. Now, if you search um, 
Yeah. How do you, the best way I would go to, if, if you have a local library or a university library that you can access, the best way is to go in and to access it through because they I'm sure would have um, the resources. The EPI index are the, EPI database is a list of all the papers that the House of Commons and British Parliament um, um, created. And it, it's a huge database. Now, you used to be able to access it. Um, I think you can access it for free, but it's a bit roundabout how you can actually get into it. Um, you can either Google EPI, E-P-P-I, or you can Google House of Parliament papers. And you should, I, I will put that up for some people that are just interested to look because there's a huge amount of information in it. Um, and as you know, before 1922, most of the Irish records would have been held in at being a part of the Bridget, British, um, you know, the kingdom, uh, so to speak. They would have they would have held those records. So, but Epi is very. It's a very interesting website, and there's a lot of information. The census information is there. Um, there's a lot of extracts, but there's a lot of other information that you can use for that. Um, so, I will add that onto that website. Um, anything else, Valerie? Did you? Uh, yeah. I know we're going um, quarter to ten, but I'm search if somebody came back from another country. Well, that's where the, the that's where that search box can be very useful in the 1911 census. If somebody came back, um, you know, somebody was born elsewhere and returned. There was an awful lot of that that happened. That people that emigrated in, you know, let's say from 1850, 60, 70 onwards, or people that emigrated in 1870, 80, 90, they returned and they were enumerated in the censuses, even in the 1901 census. So either one, um, that can be very useful. It's a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting exercise to use that search box in your own townland to see if there was anybody born in America that was enumerated. You might be very surprised and in rural areas where people did return. Now they may have then gone back afterwards, but people did return. And, and you know, that, that can be sometimes why you can't find them in the 1900 census or in the other, you know, other country censuses. Okay. Um, somebody else asked, where can the pension applications be found? The pension applications can be found on the National Archives website, the census search forms. Now, the actual pension, the, the better if you can access it, Find My Past has digitized those, um, those forms, those application forms, and you actually will get more information off Find My Past. But having said that, if you don't have Find My Past, and you don't want to take out a Find My Past subscription, the, the, the 1841 51 census search forms are available on the National Archives website and they are listed as census 1841 stroke 51 census search forms. And you can, you just input a name um, or input a county. You don't have to input a name, you can input a county or even, I think, input a parish, um, but certainly a county and a name. So that's how you can search them. Now, and like I said, if anybody has any questions or they're still having difficulty, there's no problem, you know, no problem getting a hold of me. Uh, anybody else? Um, I think that's about it. There's a couple of people asking about the links that they're not clickable in the... Um, they're not that. clickable. You can't copy and paste them. I found that, like myself, that's to, down to Zoom. There's nothing I can do about that. You can always... Okay. I, I'm madly going into my little box seeing if I could change a number there, but I can Okay. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, as well, anyways, that's going out. Um, yeah. I think that's... Up there is. Out, and we're coming up for quarter to ten now, so that's probably going to put us up against the wall. Oh, it is. Yeah, it is. But but feel free to feel free to email either info at irelandxo.com or myself, J. Haller and Ryan at irelandxo.com. Um, and you're you're more than welcome to email me if you have any questions. And it's Road Paul Stevenson. I'm looking at you, and it's Road County Offaly. There's Road from North North Offaly there um, that you're from. Please email me. Um, there's no problem. I, I'll answer any questions. I'm going to, I, the next time, I think I will do Griffith's valuation and the land revision records because that, like that huge amount of information and very helpful. And, and this 
Lisa Landerson is really thumbs upping that one. So that's good. Um, and that will take us the 45 minutes, I'd say, to go through that. But it's, um, it's worth going through anyway. Um, so is that is that it for now? You you have my email address, and um, the, you will be getting an email in the next couple of days, and we will be updating that page further. And we will have new updates as we go along. Um, thanks very much, everybody, for coming out this morning. Some of you, I know it's late at night. Some of you, it's very early morning. And um, maybe some of you, it's the middle of the day. But it's great to see everybody. And from all over the world, South Wales and Brisbane and Dunedin, and um, New Zealand, and, and I'm sure the US, although I doubt anybody's in the US, maybe they are, um, Western Australia, Edinburgh, which is great. Um, great to see you, Mandra, Western Australia. So, okay, thank you very much. Stay safe and well, everybody, and great to see you.